Okay, it looks like everybody is here who needs to be here, so I'm going to kick us off. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, today is our sixth and actual final day of our uh, hospital budget hearing process. So we'll be hearing from both Copley and Northeastern today. Just as a quick reminder, I've been saying this at the opening of every meeting, but to arrive at our decisions for each hospital, we're going to be looking at our statute and our hospital budget rule for the guiding principles. We'll have to balance competing factors. On the one hand, we need to think about the growth in uh, healthcare expenditures and efforts to slow those down. But on the other hand, we need to ensure that our hospitals have the resources they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and provide the high quality care that we've come to expect in our communities. So as we attempt to balance cost containment and access and quality and ensure that our health system is sustainable, we should be mindful of this year's uh, incredible headwinds. We've seen historically high inflation rates, we're seeing workforce shortages, we're seeing workplace violence, we're seeing provider burnout, and we're still experiencing the, the impacts of the pandemic. So both nationally and in Vermont, hospitals are facing unprecedented financial challenges as our businesses and families and individuals. So over the next couple of weeks, and I'll, at the end of today's meeting, I'll give a timeline about our deliberation and voting process. But over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be approving uh, the hospital budgets for our 14 community hospitals. But in, in the meantime, I want to remind everybody that the board is working very, very closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work that was outlined in Act 167, which aims to move us closer to a more sustainable hospital system that ensures that Vermonters have access to high quality, affordable care. That work is gonna involve a lot of data analysis and real hospital and community engagement. And the hope is that the result will be a more sustainable path forward. So I'm gonna turn us back to the hearing today. Um, and as I do that, I wanna extend a thank you to both the Copley and the Northeastern teams for the time and effort that you've taken to prepare and submit the documents for our review. And a few housekeeping notes about the hearings today. The presentation is a public meeting and it's being recorded and transcribed. So there will be a publicly available record. If at any point during the presentation or during the questions and answers, the hospital's leadership team feels that there's some confidential information that the board should consider, please just alert us before responding. Um, if needed, we can go into an executive session and review confidential information from hospitals. Uh, executive sessions will be limited in scope just to that which would be provided by the open meeting law, limited to information such as contracts and information that would be deemed confidential under the Public Records Act. So if one of these potentially uh, confidential issues arises, I can call on our legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in that executive session and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, ask the board member for a motion to go into executive session. It's 1.30 on my computer's clock, so that means we can start. Um, so good afternoon to the Northeastern team. Uh, it's great to have you all here. And I just wanna actually take a minute, Bob, it's nice to see you. And uh, I wanna take this opportunity to thank you for all of your decades of service to the people in your community. Um, I, I see there's a transition happening there and I know you've been a very responsible steward of the you know, financial resources of your community. And so I've always appreciated your hard work and your candor and clarity while I've been at the board listening to your hearings. And uh, I just wanna wish you luck on the next chapter of your life. And I'm glad you're here today. This might be, I suspect the last official time we will see you before the board, so. Thank you, Jessica, very, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yeah, this is my 24th and final. And as I've said, and I'll say it again, I mean, this is the highlight of every year, this presentation. <laughs> I'm, this is what I'm going to miss most about not being a CFO at NVRH. Well, Bob, we can make that happen for you. I can get you a special invitation to every conference. I mean, we can deliver that VIP kind of thing, and you can come anytime you want. We, we, right. we, we, we did try to talk him into going for one of the open seats, but um, <laughs> he, he, he prefers retirement. What? He you mean did. people don't want this job? Are you kidding? Uh, yeah. Well, All right. I wouldn't do as good. As, I wouldn't do as good a job as you guys do. <laughs> well. All right. Well, I think we are ready to transition over to your presentation. Um, before we do begin, we need to swear in anybody that's planning to present or answer any questions today. So I, I'm going to turn it over to Russ McCracken, our legal counsel, who can take care of the swearing in for us. Great. Thank you, Chair Holmes. 
This is Russ McCracken, uh, attorney for the board. Uh, who from the NBRH team uh, do you think is going to be speaking and presenting today? We probably all might, yeah. All except, of us might. Except uh, Dr. Ruth, uh, who's on the list, but he's not here today. So everybody else will probably have something to say. All right, sounds good. I will go ahead and swear you in if you could raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Great, thank you. You're sworn in. And one other favor to ask. Um, it's really helpful for the transcription and the court reporter if uh, for the first time you speak, if you could identify yourself by name. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to uh, Chair Holmes. Great. Well, thank you. And I think it sounds like I'm turning it over not only to the uh, Northeastern team, but also to Kara to load up the slides. But you guys can take it away. OK, thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Tester, CEO of Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. Uh, Kara, we can move right into the introduction slide. Really pleased to introduce my team uh, who's here today. One more slide. One more. Okay. So, uh, as Jessica indicated, um, we are in a bit of a transition here. So, I'd like to introduce Andre Bissonnette, who's on my right, your left, uh, in now our chief financial officer. He loves this process so much. This is the second time around uh, within the last two weeks. So, thank you, Andre. We're pleased to have him here on the team and back in the North Country. Uh, behind me, I have Sean Burroughs our uh, Chief Information Officer, who's been with us since 2017. Diana Gibbs, one of the other newer members of our team. This is her second round, joining us last year. She waved up uh, Betty Ann Guakin, uh, our Chief HR Officer, um, here since 1999. Laura Newell, our VP of Operations and Medical Practices, here since 2013, almost coming up on a decade. Who is not present is our uh, chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Michael Roos, who is on a much well-earned vacation. And we also have Julie Schneckenberger, uh, chief nursing officer, member of the team since 2013, and she's over here behind me as well. Um, our special consultant, longtime member of the team, Bob Hersey, <laughs> in his farewell uh, event. So thank you. I want to just uh, go to the next slide and uh, just give a quick overview of NVRH. Uh, as a reminder, and for those of you who are new members joining us, we're an independent, non-for-profit, 25-bed critical, critical access hospital serving the half of Essex County and all of Caledonia counties of Vermont, a population of about 30,000 people. Our emergency room visits run about 12,500 annually given there has been some fluctuation with the pandemic over the last couple of years. We have 15 medical practices, 11 specialty practices, and four rural health clinics, and we have about 711 employees. Our mission is to be a leader in improving the health and health of our community. Next slide, please. Um, oh, yeah, you want to do this, right, Bob? I can, sure. Yeah, sure. uh, Bob Hersey, the uh, staff person, former CFO. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to uh, highlight a few things about a 2023 budget. I think I just uh, start by saying that 2023 will be a transition year for NVRH. Uh, for several years in a row, we were able to generate a, a positive operating margin, typically between one and a half and two percent of our oper uh, operating revenues, uh, until we hit fiscal 2022. Uh, and we're going to have a loss, as you've probably seen, of about $1.9 million. So 23 is transitioning us back uh, from a negative operating margin to a positive, modest positive operating margin of about 0.4%. Uh, uh, and that's part of our strategy to get back to where we had been, you know, somewhere in that 1.5% to 2% operating margin range. A part of that transition will require us to have a, a 10 and 3 quarter percent average rate increase for our services. Uh, another part, and you've heard us, I think, every year practically say we expand and add services as needed to meet community needs. 
and fiscal 23 is no different. We're doing the same thing again in, in fiscal 23. Uh, we continue to focus on reducing our avoidable ED visits. Uh, ED visits. Uh, you'll hear more about that. Uh, I do want to highlight that although you will see a trend is up a little bit in ED visits, it is down about 15% from pre-COVID time. So uh, we're still again tracking and, and doing well in the avoidable visits and uh, in reducing overall ED visits. And we are expanding our participation in value-based payment programs to include Medicare. Uh, we will be part of the Medicare risk program. Uh, we worked with One Care Vermont to come up with a risk strategy that we thought would be a palatable, palatable and appropriate for a, a critical access hospital. So we're very happy to be able to expand our participation in value-based uh, uh, programs. Um, next slide, please, Karen. So uh, if you'll indulge me, I did prepare some opening remarks that really speak to uh, what you're seeing on this slide here. Um, and I'd like to open with those. <clears throat> First off, I want to give a big shout out to the entire staff and clinicians that make up the NVRH family. After two plus years of the pandemic, it's really their hard work and the commitment to our patients that's helping to ensure the health and well-being of the communities that we serve. While we present our budget today, I just want to remind everybody that this is not about a budget. It's really about providing care to our patients who are also our friends, our family members, and our neighbors. We are passionate about our mission, and that is what has sustained us through these very challenging years. Over the last two years, I've said a number of times that while I was confident we could successfully manage patient care during the pandemic, it was what I call the long tail of COVID that I was most worried about. What you've been hearing over the last two weeks from all the hospitals is just that, the long-term fallout of a global pandemic whose impacts will be felt for years to come. These impacts include significant and growing workforce challenges, a stress system facing severe capacity issues, long-term underinvestment in facilities and infrastructure, and unprecedented inflation. Regarding workforce, I really think it's important to note and recognize that our staff are stretched thin. These heroes, our nurses, LNAs, techs, clinicians, and support staff are frankly exhausted. While workforce shortages predate the pandemic, they're much worse today. NVRH currently has over 50 unfilled positions despite our best recruiting efforts. And I think we're in better shape than many Vermont hospitals. We've been gap filling critical nursing shortages with traveler staff at a significant cost to our budget. And that challenge will continue. Despite that, we've made long-term investments in workforce development, including partnering with the Vermont State College System to expand nursing programs at, on our Linden campus supporting LNA programs at our local high schools and adult education programs, and enhancing internal education programs to help grow our staff. Unfortunately, these years are going to, these investments are going to take years to bear fruit. I also should note that on top of the workforce shortages, we have a regional housing crisis, and that is compounding our challenge around recruiting professionals to this area. Meanwhile, the entire healthcare system is at or over capacity. We're seeing a continued rise in mental health borders in our ED. And with that, we've seen a rise in workplace violence, which is contributing to our own workforce challenges. This is also compounded by the fact that our local law enforcement agencies are understaffed and they are strained to respond when there's an event here at the hospital. We struggle to place post-acute patients in acute care facilities. And as you know, the region SNFs have their own problems. And finally, our tertiary care facilities are operating at or near 100% capacity, meaning that our smaller hospitals are keeping sicker patients longer or sending them farther and farther away to receive appropriate care, which is really hard on the families and caregivers who support those patients. Years of frugal budgets have also meant delayed investments in our infrastructure, and now construction inflation is making long-delayed projects even more expensive than they were before the pandemic. 
For example, our emergency department, which was built 50 years ago, that's five zero years ago, cannot cope with the volume and complexity of today's patient population and is in dire need of expansion. Twice this week, we had medical surges where capacity in our emergency department was 200% of capacity. Now, in the coming slides in this presentation today, you're gonna to hear the, us expound in more detail on these issues and more. We are committed to serving our community and we're gonna be here for our patients. And this budget cycle represents a defining moment for Vermont's healthcare system. After years of limited investment, will we take the steps necessary to capitalize, to stabilize the system? And we need your help by su and support by approving the budget that you see presented here today. Thank you. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of our income statement. Um, just on this slide, I just wanna highlight the, the projection for 2022, as I mentioned, uh, it's a loss of about 1.9 million. I also want to point out that this is higher than the budget, uh, the loss we projected when we submitted the 23 budget uh, back in early July. Um, we've had some significant downturn in, in some um, upturn, I should say, in some of our expenses um, that's created an even more significant loss than we had expected. Uh, and you can see that, again, in 2023, we're planning to get back and have a positive uh, operating margin again. Uh, next slide, please. So our budget to budget NPR growth um, is about 13%. Uh, these are the components of that. It's a rate increase, as I said, it's about 10.75%. Uh, and you can see it only affects the commercial and self-pay population. Raising our rates um, does not affect reimbursement for either Medicare or Medicaid. We're looking about a 4% uh, utilization, overall utilization increase. And you can see that that's uh, distributed amongst all the, the major pay groups. Our fixed prospective payments are going up about 731,000. And part of this, if you look at a couple lines down, you'll see uh, a drop in the Medicaid payer mix. And, and what I think we're seeing is an increasing shift from the fee-for-service Medicaid to the, um, the, the fixed, pers fixed prospective payment to Medicaid. Uh, we did have one provider acquisition that is included in the 23 budget. That's a podiatry practice. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, looking down under the Medicare reimbursement payer mix, some of that is a little bit of an increased payer mix, Medicare payer mix, but a lot of that has to do with our cost report impact. Um, Medicare's uh, reimbursement goes up as our expenses go up. Uh, that's result of our being a critical access hospital. So although rates don't affect that Medicare reimbursement, our increased costs do, and, and that's what we're seeing uh, in, in that line item. Uh, the other thing I just want to highlight here is we uh, used to have Medicare replacement as part of commercial, uh, and it really wasn't correct. And, and what we're seeing is more and more of the Medicare population opting for the replacement Medicare products as opposed to the traditional Medicare. Uh, so we want to make sure we corrected that as, as part of this year's reporting process. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so again, we're requesting a, uh, requesting a 10.75% increase, assuming it's approved. Our five-year average rate increase will be 4.7%. Uh, it had been about three and a half to three and three quarter percent, uh, and, and again, we're asking for a more significant increase this year. Uh, each one percent of a rate increase yields about 436,000. Uh, again, that's from the commercial and self-pay population. And how we're going to achieve that rate increase is uh, increase hospital service charges by about 12 percent, a little over 12 percent and we will not increase the provider service fees at, at all. Uh, last year, we had a, a um, charge description master analysis done. Um, we took a look at us compared to some of the peer hospitals, and we're going to use that as a guideline as to how we're going to increase our rates. 
the NPI uh, increase due to utilization in, in services growth. Um, you see the list here. Uh, there are a couple that I didn't put on the list that I should have highlighted at this point, and, and those include laboratory uh, and uh, uh, infusion drugs. Um, our lab services have increased significantly. A lot of that is to do with referrals from the Norris Can Cotton Cancer Center, uh, which is down the hill from the hospital. Uh, they're seeing an increase in, in population, particularly from out of our service area, uh, and those patients are coming up here for labs. So that's part of what's driving it in addition to the, some of the COVID testing. Uh, and the, our infusion drug program uh, is very busy, and uh, as you may have heard from others, uh, those infusion drugs are incredibly expensive. So as our volume goes up, the cost of those drugs goes up, and that, that's part of our utilization uh, increase. Uh, we continue to be a more of a regional provider every year. Uh, services like uh, pulmonology, podiatry now, uh, neurology, and a lot of major joint replacements are, are now uh, patients are coming from outside of our service area for those services. Uh, we continue to use telehealth uh, where appropriate. Uh, you know, it's often a great resource and a great tool to connect with patients. So in our primary care practices, we're doing about 10 telehealth visits a week. And just a small note that the NPR increase from the uh, deputy transition is, is worth about a half a percent of our, our NPR growth. Uh, next slide, please. So I am going to stop for a minute and to turn it over to Laura to, to highlight the, this slide for us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Newell. I'm the Vice President of Operations and Medical Practices here at NBRH. A little bit of historical knowledge on the slide. Um, NBRH began working on reducing our avoidable ED visits about four years ago. Um, at the 2019, I believe, um, Green Mountain Care Board hearing, we've committed to the board that we would continue to present this data to the board each year at our hearings. Um, as you can see on the top portion of the slide, um, we've reduced, we've continually reduced our avoidable ED visits um, by quite a big percentage. Um, we've done that by, um, we started a campaign back in 2018 called Call Your PCP First. Um, we collaborated with our local group of federally qualified health centers and started sending out postcards, um, doing different media push pushes to encourage patients to call their primary care providers first prior to going to the emergency department. Um, the following year in 20, well, actually, through the following year, uh, we began um, a partnership again with our federally qualified health centers to develop a model called Northern Express Care. Northern Express Care opened its first location at Corner Medical in Lindenville uh, in early 2020, and we opened another um, location, nor or excuse me, our partners, Northern Counties opened a second location standalone in St. Johnsbury in late 2020. Northern Express Care provides walk-in primary care services to our community. Um, when you look at the section below uh, the line graph, um, you'll see the top yellow graph represents our ED visits. And the bottom, the orange line and the blue line represent our Northern Express Care visits. The gray line is a combination of all express care visits. What I really like to highlight in this graph particularly is the pattern. You'll see that when ED visits are up, express care visits are up. And what that tells me is that we're doing the right thing. One is not replacing the other. So visits are going up and they're going down in the same pattern. So that shows that express care is really a benefit to our community and really helping to drive these lower avoidable visit percentages that we're seeing. Thank you. Next slide, Next slide. please, Kara. So this uh, just shows in a graph form the trend of our rate increase requests uh, going back to fiscal 2019. Um, from 19 to 22, the average is about 3.5%. Uh, when you factor in 
what we're hoping will be approved for fiscal 23, it brings their five-year average up uh, to five, uh, 4.7%. That is 4.7% average over five years. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. In this slide, I've, I've tried to uh, illustrate the components of our 10.8%, 10.75% rate increase. Um, it does require a little explanation, so if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll dig into the details a little bit to, to explain it. So if you look at our inflation increase, um, it was about $6.5 million. Um, some of that is going to get reimbursed by Medicare. Right, because again, our cost-based critical access uh, reimbursement will have some of those inflationary costs covered by Medicare through the cost report process. Uh, what's left is about $4.1 million. And if you think again, each one of our rate increase represents about 436,000. Uh, that's a 9.3% increase, right? So the 4.1 million divided by the 436,000 is about 9.3%. And so that's how that formula works for, for each of these categories related to cost. So again, the other salary increase, same kind of thing. What's, what's left is uh, it requires after Medicare, what's left of the increase after Medicare reimbursement uh, is about a 2.1% rate increase. Again, same with the cost of the travelers, uh, the provider tax increase. Um, the cost shift increase is just you know, what that increase is Medicare is not participating in that. Uh, they're part of the reason for the cost shift increase. Uh, so we need about a 3.2% rate increase to cover that. Uh, similar for our uncompensated care increase, Medicare does not participate in that. Uh, but then those increases are offset uh, by volume. So our volume increase, uh, again, using that 436,000 as a denominator, uh, allows us 6.2% less of a rate increase. Uh, the cost savings we've achieved about $1.7 million. You know, after the last reimbursement, in this case from Medicare, that reduces our rate increase request for by about 2.4%. So hopefully, you know, you add all those together, about 10 and three quarter percent, and that's how we get to our rate increase and, and the components of it. Next slide, please. Some of our payer assumptions uh, for the year, um, no major changes with our commercial payers uh, contracts uh, have been included in the budget. We do not anticipate any changes to Medicare uh, uh, critical access payment rules uh, during fiscal 23. Uh, nothing has come across uh, my desk at least. Uh, I, I wrote uh, there's a slight decrease in Medicaid fee schedule, but that's really minimal. I, it's so insignificant, I probably should not have put it on there. So just disregard that, pretend you don't see it. <laughs> um, we, as I mentioned, are going to participate in the Medicare risk program. We're not in the, uh, the AIPBP model, uh, the all-inclusive population-based uh, payment model. Um, Again, we worked out a, an arrangement with one care that minimizes our risk. It does not affect our Medicare cost report reimbursement, which uh, is, it was a big change as well as to reduce risk. So that allowed us to participate in the, the Medicare risk program. That'll be starting in calendar 2023, right? Because one care uh, programs start on a calendar year basis, not a, a fiscal year basis. Um, we don't expect any significant changes in our uncompensated care trend. Uh, we're not changing our policies at this point. Um, we, there was a little bit of an increase in uncompensated care as a percent uh, related to, frankly, like the rate increases we're expecting. Our rates are going up. Um, other hospitals we uh, have seen are going to have rate increases as well. And what we're anticipating is that may result in Healthcare costs, more healthcare costs being passed on to employees, uh, which may bump up our uncompensated care a bit. So uh, that was factored into our fiscal 23 budget. Next slide, please. So our one adjustment uh, was the podiatry clinic. 
Uh, we had a, a longtime podiatrist, I think the only podiatrist in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, retired. Uh, before doing so, they tried to bring on a partner to take over the practice, but was not able to do so. Um, and again, this is an example of NRERH needing to help meet a community need. So we agreed to take over and, and set up our own podiatry clinic. Um, that started actually this week. Um, and so you can see in fiscal 23, we anticipate about $490,000 of new net patient revenue associated with that clinic. Uh, it, again, it's incredibly needed uh, in this community and we're, we're fortunate that we were able to step in and, and again, meet that community need. Uh, there are no other accounting changes adopted in 22 or 23 that, that affect our income statement or balance sheet. Oh, cash flow. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this eye chart tester is our <laughs> other operating and non-operating revenue. Um, a couple things to highlight here. Our 340B program uh, is, is dropped and is, is continues to drop. Um, you know, the big pharma continues to exclude drugs from being eligible for that 340B program. And what we're also seeing, at least in this community, is the impact of, of Walgreens not being able to provide full service pharmacy, uh, retail pharmacy to the community. And we've seen a fairly significant drop in, in our Walgreens revenue that has not been picked up by others at this point. So we're, we're doing a little bit of research to, to find out what's going on there. Um, but we see this as, as an increasing risk in our 23 budget. Um, you know, we, we budgeted a little bit of a pickup. We are working and doing what we can, working with our providers uh, to find alternatives that would, for the drugs that, uh, that would be 340B eligible. Um, but, but I am concerned that uh, we may not see that growth from 22 budget, uh, um, 22 projected to, to 23 uh, budget. Um, again, that's a, a risk at this point. Um, the reference lab work is, uh, we do a lot of reference labs for our, our QHC partners, and that's what that is. Uh, we do not anticipate any more PRF funds. We got $2.4 million uh, this year, fiscal 22. That was not anticipated. I don't foresee that happening again in fiscal 23. Uh, just uh, non-operating revenue is here, primarily gains or losses. We do have a little bit of investment income as non-operating revenue, but the major component of non-operating revenue year to year is gains or losses in our invested funds. And uh, as some of you have heard me say for many years, I, if I could predict what the stock market is going to do, I would not be sitting here today. Next slide, please. So this is taking a look at the expense side. Um, of the income statement, um, you can see we're looking at about a 12.5% increase in expenses. Um, inflationary, there's an appendix that, that, that detailed a lot of this. Um, I will, uh, will say that the, that, that salary number, uh, a lot of that is also inflationary. It's a, a combination of some carryover of increases we gave early in fiscal 22 and late in fiscal 21 even. Uh, and the impact that the salary increases have on our employees' uh, paid time off uh, benefit program. Uh, travelers, if you look again on a budget-to-budget -budget basis, we're increasing expenses by about 1.8 million. Uh, but I need to highlight here that if you look at where we are in fiscal 22 projected, our traveler expenses are about $4.4 .4 million. So we've actually reduced Travel expenses from 4.4 .4 to about 1. Point, uh, I'm sorry, to about 2.6 million dollars, uh, but that still results in again about a 1.8 million increase. So we're doing what we can. We've had a lot of success, and we we'll continue to hope to have a lot of success reducing our reliance on travelers. Um, but that still con continues to be a significant cost uh, to us and other hospitals. Uh, the drug cost here, is, as I mentioned previously. A lot of uh, high-cost infusion drugs um, for, our, for our patients, and that's what we anticipate on a budget-to-budget -budget basis the increase in those costs will be. Uh, provider tax is just uh, 
a function of our net patient revenue going up, right? That's a 6% of our net patient revenue, and that's where that calculation comes from. Uh, we were able so to achieve uh, some significant cost savings. Uh, we have a two-year uh, what we call sustainability program at NVRH that we've uh, incorpor incorporates uh, pretty much every employee in the hospital is, is, uh, is part of this program to help us identify some opportunities to reduce expenses. Uh, we have a two-year goal uh, to reduce expenses by about three and a half million dollars. Uh, the fiscal year plan was about 1.7 million. Uh, and as you can see, we've achieved uh, most of that goal, or actually it's rounding, it's, it's, we've achieved all that goal for fiscal 23. A lot of that is efficiencies uh, departmentally. Uh, and with our providers, we have, have lost uh, through retirement uh, several providers uh, who won't be replaced, but their patients and their, their volumes will be picked up by other providers that are here. So we're achieving those savings without really any change in our net patient revenue. We also made a fairly significant change uh, in uh, drug formula as it relates to surgical patients uh, that will save us about $400,000. Again, that's, that's part of that cost savings. Um, the next line item, this uh, I mentioned a little bit about our orthopedic and major joint patients. Uh, the volume continues to increase. And this just focuses on most of that 400,000 is the cost of uh, joint replacement uh, uh, pieces, prosthetics pieces. Um, the physician transfer is again the podiatry re related cost. You saw the revenue going up for that practice and this is the expense side of the equation. Um, the other things I don't really have any things to highlight major volume, the 1.4 is our estimate of, uh, of what the volume increase does to our expenses for the year on a budget to budget basis. Next slide, please. The, our operating margin trends, you know, uh, just what I've been, what I had said previously, we had Pretty consistently had about one and a half to two percent operating margin, and then uh, a little bump in the road in 2022. Um, and again, our plan for 23 is to get back to a modest uh, operating margin of about 0.4%. Uh, so this just uh, again illustrates what I had said previously. Next slide, please. So our operating margin and total margin, oh, I feel like I've said this before. Um, <laughs> the five-year average is 0.7%, is, uh, um, returning to a positive margin in 23. Uh, just to, again, going back to our longer-term strategy, we need to get to about a 2% operating margin starting in fiscal 24 and beyond <clears throat> to support all of our operations, but in particular, as we look to our uh, West Wing expansion project with a cost of about $19 million. Um, to support that project in addition to all of our other efforts, we're gonna need to get back to that 2% operating margin range. And uh, the total margin, a total margin is just operating plus gains and losses on investments. And as I said, I don't, uh, I don't budget those gains and losses on investments. Next slide, please. Uh, this, another eye chart test, um, really just want to highlight here our, our cash, you know, our, our day's cash on hand have, have dropped um, when we submitted this, or, there are about 105 days, and uh, that, that's a pretty low level for, for NVRH, you know, we want to be more in the 125 plus range. Uh, so you'll see in a couple more slides, we have a strategy to get there, but um, the balance sheet, the most concerning thing here on the balance sheet is, is our, our, our cash position, which uh, we, we want to improve and have a strategy to do so. Next, please. Uh, we were asked to present a, a cash flow budget uh, summary. So uh, here it is. You know, our, our plan is to increase cash slightly you know, by 235000 uh, it's heading in the right direction, but the key component of this is to get that gain from operations uh, back into that one, 
at that $2 million range. Um, and obviously that will help us generate more cash. Now uh, here I just want to um, highlight where, when I say investment in PPE, that's not investment in you know, personal protection. We're not going out and buying four and a half million dollars of gloves and gowns and stuff. That's, uh, that's property, plant, and equipment, uh, PPE in this case. Next slide, please. And here's part of our strategy, you know, to uh, to gain, to get those days cash on hand to back up, um, return to the positive operating margin. Fiscal 23 is a first step towards that. Um, our financial sustainability, sustainability program, I mentioned, again, the goal of about uh, three and a half million dollars over two years. And we've had to pare back capital spending in 22 and 23 um, to help preserve cash. Um, on the positive side, looking at our balance sheet, our, our capital structure ratios are still okay, um, which is important as we're going to need long-term debt uh, for that West Wing project. Um, so we need to be able to demonstrate the ability to repay. And, and so our, our, our debt capacity ratios indicate that we will be able to take on that debt and, and we'll be able to pay um, it. And that's it for me for now. So next slide, please. And we'll uh, turn it over to Diana. Diana. Yes. Correct. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. Diana Gibbs, Vice President of Marketing and Community Health Improvement here in the back. Um, I just wanted to really illustrate for you the breadth and depth of NBRH's reach in our community and here in the hospital around equity. Um, so starting with kind of community priorities and that community health lens, NBRH really has been a leader in our health service area around community health improvement, addressing gaps in our continuum of care, and really looking at opportunities to um, enhance DEI efforts that aim to really address our health inequities experienced in our population. <coughs> Um, NDRH has worked really hard to continually monitor the needs of our patients and communities and in turn developed collaborative solutions with our internal and external partners, including the health and human service partners here in the Northeast Kingdom. Over the last 10 years or so, NDRH has really been a leader around bringing these critical community partners and organizations together to build the NEK Prosper um, Accountable Health Community Model. NEK Prosper's broad sector representation really allows for this unified response and an aligned vision um, that allows us to really be responsive to the ongoing and emerging needs in our vulnerable populations here in the community, addressing those root causes and social drivers of poor health. Um, our shared vision, as you can see on the slide here, is really to have a community where everyone has the opportunity to be financially secure, mentally healthy, physically healthy, well-nourished, and well-housed. Um, in the last year, we've engaged our partners in regional training through the Vermont Community Health Equity Partnership to advance our knowledge and capacity to evolve and shift decision making to ensure a high level of engagement from our most vulnerable community members. And this is an ongoing effort, um, and we do have the support and partnership of all of our NEK Prosper organizations um, who are part of this necessary evolution. Kind of bringing that back to our NVRH healthcare system. Um, we really do have great systems in place, workflows to conduct universal screenings across the social determinants of health to really pair social care and health care for that whole person wellness. Uh, we have programs and resources that provide additional support to our providers and our practices through our community connections program, staffed by trained community health workers who can provide navigation assistance for needed, needed resources, connections to care. Um, they also have some unmet needs funds to help with financial assistance um, raised through our philanthropy efforts. We have transportation vouchers for rides to appointments, so wellness appointments, and to work. Um, and we also have navigators to assist with health insurance enrollment and provide health coaching on a non-clinical basis around chronic disease management and tobacco cessation. Um, we also have language-wide resources available on demand to uh, really help meet access needs for anyone who might choose NBRH for their care needs. Um, NBRH also supports some youth substance misuse prevention programming. 
um, and through their strategic planning process um, supported by some NEK Prevention Center of Excellence funds, they have identified DEA as the, uh, DEI excuse me, as being at the forefront looking at our LGBTQIA plus and BIPOC populations as, as having greater needs for supports in our communities and have used funding and infrastructure money to really support those efforts in schools. Um, and really looking at creating gender and sexuality alliances in schools and supporting a lot of those needs. Um, as we know from youth risk behavior survey data, those populations that I've just identified are about two and a half times um, higher, are more likely to experience mental illness and or substance use at two and a half times their heterosexual or cisgender peers. Um, and, and really really that back into NBRH and our systems internally here, um, it's, DEI is incredibly important to us in terms of workforce and patient care. Um, we as leadership team here have had at length discussions on this topic and have recently identified a need to understand where we are and where we aspire to be. Um, and we've applied for some funding through the Vermont Community Foundation to help us uh, potentially acquire a consultant who could work, help us work through the process of really understanding what our baseline is and what those opportunities are for us to continue to work toward a culture of equity. Um, and we do feel that this process will really help us to um, inform our next strategic planning process, really examining those new and persistent challenges that individuals in our communities face. And um, we're hopeful that this DEI plan will really be a blueprint for operating pr parameters, elevating NBRH's programming to be more inclusive and diverse, um, meeting any unique healthcare needs of our priority populations. Um, and, and at the end of that, we really hope to have a well-informed staff who can make more mindful, culturally and emotionally intelligent decisions, both in terms of clinical and administrative operations, that will enhance the work that we're doing already. Um, and at the end of the day, it's our goal to ensure that we have broad engagement across NVRH from the leadership down through to our staff and stakeholders and the community to have a diversity of voices um, in the efforts to reassign who we are and who we seek to be in this post-pandemic environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please, Karen. And I'll turn it back to Laura Newell. Hi. Um, I had provided some more information in the supplemental inf in the supplemental data, so that will give you some explanations on this. But what I did want to highlight on this slide was kind of right where the mouse is, um, pulmonology, uh, you'll see the low percentage of 9% under the referral lag percent or appointments <clears throat> scheduled within 72 hours. And I think that this line item just really highlights the stress that we're feeling here at NVRH um, within our specialties especially. Um, we are, we've got not only an aging population, but we've got an influx of um, patients coming from outside our health service areas that are really taxing our specialties. Um, we're doing a great job, the offices and staff providers, um, secretaries are doing a great job in managing all these patients that are coming to us um, to kind of keep these wait times down um, as much as possible. Um, they, they do such an amazing job of triaging each and every individual um, appointment request um, and, and getting those patients in when they need to be seen. So when you see line items like pulmonology where it says patients aren't getting in for six months, um, that's actually not entirely true. Um, as we get referrals that are more urgent, we're figuring out different ways to shuffle the schedule and move things around and double book patients to get them in when they, are, when they need to be seen. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that one item. I think the rest is pretty self-explanatory and I'm happy to answer any questions later on this slide. Next slide. I can go to the next one, Kara. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Laura talked about that. <clears throat> okay, risks. So we're starting with risks and opportunities. Um, I guess I get the risk slide. I'm sure that many of you are probably sick of hearing um, 
what the risks are because they're pretty universal. Uh, first off is the is just how, just how tight the labor market is and the impacts that's having on recruitment and then retention at all levels of the institution. You know, it's 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 not just I know like nursing gets top billing, but it's really not just our nursing staff. We're struggling to find you know. Uh, people to clean the hospital, people to uh, in food services to help um, support our patients and their dietary needs. It's really at all levels of the institution. And that's a problem that, that we f feel is probably going to persist um, in the coming year or years. I mentioned in my opening remarks the housing situation. I, I, like, I've never seen anything like this. Who ever imagined that we'd have such a housing crisis here in the Northeast Kingdom? We've lost... Um, We've lost st potential staff who've accepted positions here. We're going to move to the area to take a great job at NVRH, and then they had to back out because they could not find housing that met their or their family's needs. That is a serious problem, and it's going to be one more barrier that we have to address to address our workforce challenges. 340B program, um, we have that program has been under strain the last couple of years. Um, we're seeing continued erosion in that program. That revenue um, is, is essential for critical access hospitals and, um, and, and puts us at tremendous risk as we lose that revenue. Uh, we have to find other ways to make up for it. Inflationary pressures, it's across the board. Cost of labor, pressures in the supply chain, rising prices in supplies, equipment, and of course construction, especially when we're trying to do major uh, investments in our facilities to maintain the health and quality of services that we provide to our community. The chronic strain on our mental health system um, is, is, is an ongoing issue. Um, you know, there was a day, I think it was last week, we had seven, seven mental health patients in our nine bed ED. Let me say that again, seven mental health patients, nine bed ED. Um, and the, the issues around workplace violence are very real, and that's hurting our staff and impacting our staff and our ability to staff. People, people are, are, are paying attention to this. Um, and then overall system capacity, availability of tertiary beds, mental health beds, and post-acute beds are all impacting us. Next slide, please. Let's see. Uh, this just kind of highlights where we are with um, with the mental health beds. Sean Burrows, I think you were going to make some comments about the data here. Yep, I can do that uh, for the scribe. My name is Sean Burrows. I'm the Chief Information and Security Officer here at MBRH. Um, you can see the data before you. Uh, essentially, it's very clear. We're seeing more patients. Uh, we get, don't have August data in yet, but. Um, we're seeing a lot more pediatric patients with no place to place them. They're staying longer. They're more complex. And as the risk section highlighted, uh, we're, we're seeing more response from the public and the community around workplace violence and how they interact with hospital staff. About a year ago now, we contracted with Securitas Security Services to cover um, both the grounds and our offsite practices. And they've reported uh, no less than 68 interactions with agitated patients or visitors. 33 of those escalated into code gray, where we have an all-code response, and two of those are code silvers, where um, someone was brandishing a weapon, as well as part of the incident. So as you can see, the, the mental health crisis for the, the risk that Sean highlighted, as well as our own interaction with patients, is just continuing to escalate. It burns out staff. It adds extra, extra costs for security services, cameras, monitoring, patrolling, uh, and it is just it adds to the problem with our budgetary cycle to support these additional needs. Thank you. Next slide. So in our in our in his debut as CFO of NVRH, Andre finally gets a chance to speak. And he gets the positive slide. How did that work, Andre? Yeah, I worked out for <laughs> as Andre Bissonnette, I'm the CFO. Um, you know, with the opposite of risk, we also have some opportunities, as Bob discussed. We have a, a financial sustainability program. Uh, that was developed in this uh, the spring and at the towards the end of this budget process. Um, that is not a static uh, set of items. Uh, we will continue to look for items for efficiencies and cost savings. Uh, leverage One Care data, uh, OCV One Care Vermont, and analytics to further improve care, uh, care coordination. Um, they've got a, a vast amount of data and some really good resources at One Care. 
uh, and we need to continue to tap into that to look at the population of our area and leverage that data. Um, Bob and, and uh, Sean spoke about the risks of the 340B program. There's also opportunities to continue using it uh, to reduce our in-house in drug costs. Um, the 340B program is, is kind of like uh, what the old generic drug program was. It's kind of a whack-a-mole. So where something may come off of 340B, we got to be uh, judicious in making sure we find other drugs that are on the 340B program. And then continue work with providers to offset lost 340B revenue due to drug manufacturers withdrawal from the program. Next slide, please. The value-based participation, uh, as Bob stated, uh, we're, we have signed up for the Medicare uh, non-AIPBP um, track with OneCare for next year. This is a slide that outlines uh, the the uh, covered lives, the attributed lives, and the uh, the, the uh, FPP and maximum upside and downside risk for each of those programs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So this uh, talks about our capital investment plans and our, our capital replacement uh, cycle involves you know, routine capital replacement, routine facility replacement and upgrade, um, technology, uh, and major investments such as a CON uh, project. Um, we've had to peer back spending in, in the top of those first three categories, the routine equipment and facility replacement and technology uh, because of our, our losses uh, for fiscal 22. Um, a positive note, uh, we are going to start our mental health support area construction, hopefully very soon. Um, that, that's a, a function of just the supply chain issues for material, uh, construction materials. Um, if we can get the materials in on time, we hope to get that project started uh, in the next couple months. Um, this was originally part of our West Wing expansion project. Uh, but we have been able, we were able to get it uh, through the, the CO1 support, the staff support uh, as a separate project because it, it met all the criteria and that enabled us to start this project ahead of the major project. Uh, and we just talked about the, the needs of, of, of supporting our mental health patients in the ED. Uh, we'll be able to do so more quickly now and, and uh, provide better support uh, with, this, with this expansion. So we're pleased to be able to start it soon, uh, and I do want to highlight the fact that uh, this was completely funded by congressionally dis directed spending appropriation that uh, Senator Leahy uh, got for NVRH. Um, so I was thankful for his efforts. Our average age of plant is just about the, the Vermont average at this point, 14.5%. Uh, um, you know, we, that expansion project, 14 and a half years, I'm sorry, not 14 and a half percent. Um, the expansion project will, will reduce that uh, once it gets completed. Uh, and we do hope to have the uh, West Wing CO application in. Um, at this point, I'd say either late fall, even maybe early winter by the time we get it in. It's, uh, um, but it will be done soon. Um, again, those of you who've been through a, this process with us uh, have heard this, I think, for at least the last six years. Uh, it's been been uh, on and off uh, a few times. COVID certainly had a significant impact on the project timing, uh, but it is back on track. Um, and by the, the way, it's not listed here, but we're planning to you use USDA uh, low interest loans as uh, funding the, the significant portion of this project. Uh, we do not anticipate filing any other CON applications between 23 and fiscal 26, other than the, uh, the West Wing project. Next slide, please. So we supplied separately a lot of information, detailed information uh, on the supplemental data monitoring. I, I can just touch on a couple things here. Um, but again, there's a lot more details in what was submitted separately uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board and to the staff. Um, you can see the slide here. I want to, want to highlight it. If you look at the next slide, please, Kara. Um, 
what this slide illustrates just briefly is that we continue to see a increasing percentage of our outpatient services provided to, to non-locals. Um, the trend has gone from like 20% outpatient non-locals to about almost 23, a little over 23 and a half percent. Um, you know, I spoke a little bit earlier about us becoming a sort of a regional provider. I think that, that illustrates that that, that that is happening. And again, I just ask you to look at the, uh, the supplemental data that we submitted for additional comments. And next slide, please. Uh, this is the reimbursement analysis. Um, this is in, in our the materials again in more detail in the supplemental data we sub provided. Um, what this illustrates is we're high in a few of the services that were looked at, um, significantly higher than the range. Most we were right at or close to the range. Uh, we did not find any discernible reasons or, or impact of reimbursement that would have created that, that variation. Uh, we continue to look and continue to dig. And as data becomes, a more current data becomes available, it'll certainly be more meaningful. I think this data only goes through 2019. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I think I, I touched on this. Um, I do want to note that we do serve an older population and with more disabilities, uh, and, and that was borne out in the data that we looked at as well in this, this material. And it's, uh, actually, the next slide, I think, would show that if you go to the next slide, please, it shows that our looking at the disabilities and the age of our population, it's a higher than the state average in both categories. There's one more slide, I think. Uh, Kara, if you could go to that, please. Uh, yeah. Impact of COVID, I think uh, at this point, we don't have any material impact on COVID on access to care or wait times. As mentioned, we continue to use telehealth where it's appropriate. Um, some of the lessons learned and still maintained, the employees are working remotely. Um, our renewed commitment to focus on our staff well-being, uh, tremendous pressure on staff, as you are well aware, through the COVID crisis. And staying innovative in the way we deliver care. You know, we stood up some drive-through services as an example of, of our innovation uh, during COVID. And uh, so we continue to find ways to be innovative in, in how care is delivered. And just the importance of negative pressure rooms, and particularly as we're building a new ED, it's important to take the lessons learned from COVID into consideration as we construct the, the, the restoring and ED expansion. Uh, next slide, please, which I think is time for questions. Great. Thank you, NVRH team. Really appreciate your presentation. It was really clear. Um, I, I also want to just take a second to acknowledge the tremendous work that you all have done to reduce those avoidable ED visits. I, I remember back several years ago, we started discussing your avoidable ED visits uh, here at the board. So I know it's been a sustained effort over the years. It's really impressive and um, you're focused on it as a model for other hospitals. So wanted to quickly acknowledge that because I, I know where you've come from. So you've come a long way. I appreciate that effort. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, and you may get some other questions from other board members, but I just wanted to, I've been here long enough to know how much work you've done on that. So it's really appreciated. Um, I think with that, I'm just going to, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. This is to help our board members, you know, compile their questions and allow everybody just a little stretch break, eye stretch break and all of that. So we'll come back at 2.40 and we'll start with board questions. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. okay so with that, I am going to turn it over to member Lunch uh, for questions. Great. Thank you. Well, Bob actually anticipated many of the questions that I've been asking others. So uh, I have one comment and one question. Um, the question uh, I would ask about the travelers. Um, so you mentioned that um, in 22, you had budgeted 0.6 million 
that the reality of this year has been 4.6 million and that for 23, you've reduced that down to 2.3 million. So thank you for that. Um, what I'm wondering is if you could give us a sense of number of humans and uh, the per hour cost. That just helps us compare uh, to other hospitals around the state so we can kind of get a sense of uh, how things compare. Yeah, the per hour cost, I know we budgeted $100 an hour. I believe it was a total of a little over seven FTE equivalents for, um, for the number of bodies. We have 15 right now. Yeah, it's, I'm talking, yes, for 15 now, but it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, in the budget, yeah, down to, I think seven was the number. Mm -hmm. Great. I will try and see if I can. That's great, and you can follow up. You don't, you don't, you know, if you don't have it handy, that's, that's totally fine, but that gives us a sense of where you are now versus where you're hoping to be over the budget, yeah. and. Um, yeah, I, my, I will, can I just make a comment there, Robin, um, on, on travelers, you know, keep in mind that we put this budget together, what, three months ago, really, and we were yeah. seeing that collapse yeah. in traveler rates. Uh, what our internal recruiter is telling us right now is the market for travelers is tightening up again. Um, as larger national health systems are anticipating a challenging winter, they're starting to to, to, um, to try to grab travelers, and that's driving rates back up. So we, we had budgeted $100 an hour anticipating that the market was easing up. Um, yeah. We're starting to see that climb back to $125 an hour. So uh, I, I hate to be a downer, but, but that, you know, that's just the reality. Yep. Yeah. No, it's so helpful I, I to get your that. experience. I will follow up, Robin, with, with Sarah and the staff and give them a, an exact number. But, uh, yeah, there's $100 an hour I know is what we budgeted for the read. Yeah. I, I'll give it the number of FTEs. Thank you. Um, and then my comment was um, in relationship to um, your avoidable ED visit slide, which I think is slide 10. Um, I thank you for providing the data. Super interesting. And I want to echo Jess's congratulations on all your hard work um, in terms of reducing avoidable ED usage and, and see, really seeing that fall significantly from the 18 and 19 levels. That's really wonderful to see. So congratulations. Um, my comment, my additional comment was just uh, one of the things that we saw in the qualified health plan rate review process was some data related to COVID surges and ED and urgent care uses, which showed that with a COVID surge, ED and urgent care goes down. And I think we can see that same sort of trend in your data here with, with the ups and downs of the usage. So I just wanted to mention that in case you hadn't heard about that other data, um, because I did find it useful or interesting that it, it flowed. So with that, that's all I have. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. And um, I will ask to turn it over to Board Member Pelham. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, I felt like I was uh, lined up against a football team when I first uh, turned your screen on. That uh, you know, there you are in perfect formation, and here I am sitting in my lip, my uh, dining room all alone. It's like <laughs> this might not end, you know end nicely, but it's uh, you're you're you you look organized and. Uh, and, and you are organized, and every time that I've engaged with you, you've always been organized. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I, I have a few questions, um, probably e easy to answer. But I remember in some of our other conversations in uh, past years, um, you had developed some relationships with the hospital of Littleton, I think, um, and. Uh, you know, there were some joint staffing, you know, issues. And I'm just wondering, you know, have has uh, that relationship sustained um, COVID-19 or, uh, or, or, or is we kind of living in a siloed area, era? Um, just wondering how that relationship has unfolded over time. Laura? <laughs> yeah, we'll let Laura feel that one. Um, so, yes, that was with our ENT services, um, ENT and allergy. Um, last year, last August, um, we we worked out with Littleton that um, 
Dr. Dean Rankin would become our full-time employee because we were needing um, more ENT services than what we actually had with Littleton's contract. Um, and so Dr. Rankin became our employee and he is here full-time now. He's here four days a week and we actually added um, a nurse practitioner to his service as well. But we do, we do still contract with Littleton um, we have a provider that comes over on Fridays and provides ENT services, and then we also um, utilize them for our allergy services. So that that partnership is still alive and kicking. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add that Dr. Rankin was a mutual mutually agreed upon decision to have him become our employee. It's not like we right. uh, stole him and <laughs> right. uh, anything behind the scenes. It was mutually agreed upon to make that transition, just in case anybody was wondering. Yes, he lives in St. John's Ferry, so yeah. Yeah. was happy to come here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, so, just, I think I'd add, too, that Littleton, uh, I'm sorry, that Littleton seems to be more focused on the New Hampshire market and, and south of them now than, than Vermont. You know, they're really sort of the Lincoln and Plymouth New Hampshire market area that uh, seems to be where they're focused uh, at this point, too. So. But, uh, and if I could add, since you've given us the opportunity, um, the uh, you know, if you look at some of that growth and, and strain on some of our specialty care services, we said we were becoming a regional provider. You know, Littleton is a good example. What did they lose? It was, pul was it pulmonology or was it a, uh, a, a pulmonary? neuro? Yeah, a neurologist. A neurologist. And cardiology. And cardiology. So as they struggle to find uh, specialty care in their market, we're getting more referrals from that market for those specialties. And that's that's putting more strain on our own staff. We're trying to evaluate how best to meet that outside area of demand. Well, I'm just glad to hear it's an ongoing conversation. I, I, I feared that uh, COVID might have just caused walls to go up and some opportunities that were helpful might have been lost. Um, my next question is, um, you in, in your narrative talked about your, um, your financial uh, sustainability project, and it sounded like it's been successful. You had a target of 1.7 million, um, and uh, the goal was achieved. Um, and so there's that process, and it's ongoing. And then uh, we have the Act 167 process, which is uh, beginning to um, get off the ground as well. And I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts or conversations or um, expectations about how those two processes uh, might relate to one another. You, you know, Tom, I, I think the Act 157, that's still pretty new. Um, and it's not something that, that as we've been doing our own internal sustainability um, have really factored into that. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're here, we're interested, we're going to be, you know, partners through this uh, exploratory process, but I, I, I don't think one is, is, you know, we still need to maintain our own, you know, discipline and part of our sustainability efforts, which uh, it's hard when you're looking at a slide deck and you see a bullet point that says sustainability project. Uh, I got to stress, we've been putting a lot of effort into that. This is this is really important to us, and we see it an important um, component to addressing our own stability as a system here in the Northeast Kingdom. But um, I can't say that we've really put any thought into how that might relate to the um, the upcoming work. Yeah. Well, it'll unfold somehow. So I, I was. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, 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 I hope it goes well. Um, and the next, my next question was um, where you were talking about some of your, um, let me get here. You said uh, if the same number of FTEs were NVRH employees rather than travelers, the staffing costs would be approximately 1.1 million lower. And I thought to myself when I was reading that, well, there's your margin, <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> So uh, possibly, you know, it's um, and then I, I had this uh, question, which I don't think I have to ask now, but I was kind of looking at the acceleration of the reduction of the need for travelers as the fiscal um, uh, 23 unfolds, you know, that this somehow 
coming out of 22 and in, into 23, the, the pace would pick up. But it sounds like uh, you're you're getting signals that um, it might go the other other direction during uh, 2023. So I don't have to ask that question. I I, I think I think that answered it. But I, I did want to you know, in looking at the kinds of um, strategies that you've employed relative to um, <clears throat> you know uh, attracting uh, new folks. Most of those seemed financial, and I'm just wondering. If you, you know, it's it's like a carry forward, a significant wage increase, a budget of wage increase will help um, expanding, um, you know, clinical education for clinical staff. But I'm just wondering if you've developed relationships with, you know, colleges, uh, you know, schools, other institutions to help build um, kind of a feeder system uh, into your hospital. You know, this is a this is a great opportunity for uh, Julie to talk about um, some of the work and investments we're making in that space in the residency program. So, please, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Schenkenberger. You know, um, yes, we have uh, agreements and uh, relationships with the with VTC. We that's been with us for years. Um, we've also. Um, been in communication with St. Johnsbury Academy that's working on a adult education program um, for LNA, an LNA program. So we would be their clinical site and, um, you know, working with them to start that process for people that want to move into nursing or even stay in that um, role as an LNA. Uh, we have uh, had uh, just actually signed one today, a um, contract for a nurse to come from out of state to do her clinical care. Um, so we, we do have a lot of those relationships. Uh, Linden Institute also has the um, junior high school, high school students in their medical programs that they're, uh, you know, work, we partner with them as well to do that education. And then we started this year with a residency program for new grads that um, for RNs um, and to some degree LPNs. Um, and we help them gain a good solid foundation. Uh, we have some in the emergency department on, and as well on med surge. Um, so that's a good foundation. We actually had to, those nurses say that they came here because we had that residency program. And we're, we're helping them. They, as you probably all know, um, during the pandemic, it was very difficult for the students to get um, real hands-on with patients during COVID. So we're pretty excited about that, and uh, we will continue to do that. Well, those pipelines are important. Um, um, let's see, what else do I have here? Um, I had one um, <clears throat> where, uh, from I think from your narrative, uh, or no, from your pair mix table, uh, one can see the projected decline in Medicaid revenue since 2021 of uh, 1.25 million through uh, the 2023 budget, comprising a negative annual rate of 3.6%. Conversely, one can also see from the payer mix table that commercial revenues increased by 5.5 million at the annual rate um, <clears throat> of 6.3%. And my, my thought was, you know, where does this end or where does this lead in the long term? Um, uh, because I, I'm I'm getting a sense as we go through these hearings and and reading uh, hospital proposals, you know that that the cost shift has almost become embedded. It's just taken you know repeatedly. Hospitals say, well, we're not going to get anything from the rate, um, and um, you know, and, and are budgeting minuscule amounts, you know, if any, of increased Medicaid funds. But I, I just wonder where does that go in the long run? Um, I mean, maybe it's just a, a shift that we should accept and embrace and um, um, or um, but, you know, your your payer mix table kind of, uh, I think, reflected the reality that Medicaid is kind of on a stall at best and commercial is going up quite significantly. And I'm just wondering if you have any kind of long term thoughts about that or just that's the lay of the land these days. and and you got to do what you got to do. 
think I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Tom. That, yeah, that that does reflect uh, reality. I, I think that that's a really uh, tough boulder for us to push up the hill, and, and I think that's why we're in the situation we're in. Um, I'd love to see that dynamic change. I think we do need to invest more in the Medicaid program. That will help us all, whether that's you know Medicaid rates overall or you know, targeted initiatives to help, you know, boost um, reimbursement, for example, to support our birthing centers, right? Um, there are many ways to do that. Um, you know, I, for one, have been advocating with our local legislators to say that this needs to be addressed at the state level and legislatively. Um, I did send prior to our uh, presentation today, a few weeks ago, a letter to all our local legislators um, uh, asking for their support in the budgeting process and indicating that the only way to solve this problem is by investing more dollars in the Medicaid program. Beyond that, um, I, I, I'd love your suggestions if you have any thoughts on how we could better address it. Yeah, well, I, I, I do say um, from time to time that I might be guilty of the cost shift. I can't remember what I did when I was finance commissioner, but um, you know, I, I know I, I know that uh, there was always the back door to to uh, you know there, there was kind of a back door to the agency of human services where I would call Con up and say Con I need some money and uh, uh, we 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 would figure out how to print it um, but that was way back when I'm sure things have changed um, those were my questions um, and uh, thank you very much and it's good to see you all again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Board Member Walsh. Thank you, Jess. Um, and good good afternoon. I want to join my um, fellow board members in congratulating you on the hard work um, in reducing um, avoidable ED visits. That was really um, quite a lot of progress that you've shared, and it's impressive to see. Um, on uh, slide. 32 of your presentation, you had um, a graph showing prices that were on, on some of the lines already um, exceeding the, the um, at the high end or even the highest end of the range of prices. Um, and, and so then I, I'm thinking um, a double digit request for further increase in, in prices. That causes me to pause and think about the utilization assumptions of a 4% increase in utilization when there's good evidence that when patients face higher out-of-pocket expenses, they stop taking their medicine. They stop going to routine appointments. Um, they end up sicker in the long run and end up um, with avoidable ED admissions. So it could be kind of a circular um, problem uh, for you down the road, and not just for you, but for hospitals across the state uh, with the degree of price increase that we're trying to, um, that we're seeing across the, across the state. And when patients forego their routine visits or uh, uh, stop their elective procedures, oftentimes they end up with unplanned and then unreimbursed care because they're underinsured or not insured because the price of insurance has just gotten too high because the prices that we charge uh, for health care are too high. Uh, so I, I'm, I just want to share that comment that that's one of the things that I'm trying to keep in mind within our deliberations as we look at the situation across the state, that the increases that we're asking um, our commercial payers to to bear are substantial and and may not be the uh, best for the health of the state. Uh, so I just I want to share that I'll be keeping that in mind as we go forward. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to you, Jess. Okay, uh, thank you. So I just have a couple of questions. Um, I've been asking every hospital to help us understand how the 
you know, what this historical relationship is between change in charge and the effective rate change that the average commercial patient will experience um, at NVRH. So I know you're asking for a 10.75% overall change in charge, but I also recognize that depending upon your payer contracts, that may not materialize. So would you be able to, and if you can't do it now, you know, follow up with Sarah on what that actually translates into for an effective commercial rate? Um, I can tell you it's about 10.5%, a little bit less than 10.5%. Most of our commercial contracts allow uh, the increase without without being capped, but we do have some that do cap it. Um, they're not our major uh, contracts at this point, but, um, you know, we're somewhere in the 10.4, 10.5% range of the 10 and 3 quarters. Okay. So Thank 90, you. About 95%, I'd say 95 to 98%. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other question I had was, uh, in the narrative, you referenced some work that you had uh, farmed out to applied management systems, and there was a report that was expected in July um, that where they were going to help you assess efficiencies and productivities. And I'm wondering, what did they use uh, to measure productivity, and what were some of the key findings for NVRH? I, I, I can start. Um, uh, the reality is we just got the report and went through it with them yesterday. <laughs> uh, and their um, data benchmarking comes from 50 years of experience, uh, 750 clients, and 7,500 uh, studies, approximately. <laughs> all hospitals, yes, I'm sorry, hospitals of all sizes, yeah. They, they have expected, I have told this group, and they've probably heard me say it too many times, uh, I actually started working with applied management systems in 1978, so they've been around a long time, and so have I, as you can tell. <laughs> I started in kindergarten, as you can probably. <laughs> I was going to say, you must have been five when you started. Uh, 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 yeah. So yeah, they've got a lot of experience. We, we haven't really had a chance to digest and, and, and process everything that they included in the report yet. As I said, they just went through it with us yesterday afternoon. Uh, I would, a uh, couple comments. Number one, uh, the, the majority of the expense of that uh, cons con consultative engagement uh, was covered through a grant, which, which is really great. You know, we're trying to be frugal here. Um, uh, it is pretty dense. There's a lot of data presented, but their methodology is very comprehensive. So it's based on the work they've done with other hospitals and looking at best practices. Um, and then really doing detailed interviews with uh, department managers and staff throughout the, the divisions that we looked at. So um, I've been really impressed and, and impressed with the, what they've given us, but we, it's, it's going to probably take us a long time to really dig in, understand the recommendations, and evaluate how best to implement many of them here. Uh, Andre, I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, um, I, I, I echo what Bob and Sean said, um, you know, they, and to go to your point, Jessica, the, you know, they go department by department for the statistical analysis and benchmarking. So it's not one volume for the whole thing. So it's very specific. It's a deep dive. Um, I've done this before when I was at North Country. Um, we did, we used Premier for labor and benchmarking and, and implemented it. Um, the, I think AMS takes a little bit different approach where they actually really come in and understand how each every each and every department is is set up because they're all a little different compared to what you see in other hospitals, and I think that's very important to understand. Where in one hospital you may have a function in in one department X, and in our hospital it may be in Y, and understanding that and how that variation is to a benchmark is extremely important in trying to manage any kind of implementation with this. So, um, you know, I, we went through the report with them yesterday, and I was impressed with, with what they've done. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, we may circle back with you as we're trying to, you know, or we'd, off, we'd welcome your insights in what was the most helpful from that report in terms of measures of productivity. And I recognize that it may be customized to NVRH and, you know, it was very personalized with lots of interviews. But um, as we're reimagining our hospital budget process, 
uh, we're trying to at least think about measures of efficiency and productivity. And so, you know, you may have some uh, unique insights having just gone through this process of evaluating your own productivity. So what metrics were the most meaningful to you and also led to the most impactful action steps, I think would be at least what I'd be curious mm -hmm. to learn about as you as you deep dive into the report. Great. Thank you, Frank. Um, so I, just a comment about wait times. I want to thank you for your efforts to track both referral and visit lag. I think not every hospital were, was able to uh, track the, uh, the referral lags. So I really appreciated that, um, that you made the effort there. Uh, and I also, you know, it seemed like from the report that you're, you're moving people through the system better than others uh, in some cases and in most cases and where you're not, it looks like you're looking to hire. I know you mentioned pulmonology. I just wanted to mention one other area that looked a little bit concerning to me and wanted to hear more about if you had plans there, which was cardio. Um, it looked like 85% of people were waiting three months for an EKG and 70% were waiting three months for an appointment roughly. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have a strategy with cardio, particularly given, you, I know you presented some data on the aging of your population um, in particular, and you know you were looking towards pulmonology and podiatry because of the aging population. I would think cardiology would be similar in that area. I also recognize it's really hard to recruit in cardiology. So just wanted to ask some questions about that. Um, and so when you look at the snapshot of time, um, it was July 1st to July 15th. So it was patients, you know, one month from them would have, one month from that point would be August. And there's quite a few vacations at that point. Um, and so it actually wasn't three months, but it was two months. <laughs> it was more like six to eight weeks um, rather than the three months period, um, but those were the uh, data points that we were given. So when it was over a month, we put it into the three month column. So it actually wasn't quite, okay. not quite as bad as it looks. There's a little bit more of a story there. So thank you for asking that. Um, it, so yes, it is, the, the data is better than it looks here on paper, okay. but we are keeping an eye on cardiology um, in particular, uh, we were seeing an influx of patients, uh, specifically from North Country, um, when they lost their cardiologist. Um, they, I believe, hired a cardiologist, um, and so we're hoping that our volumes kind of wane back to normal. But, but Littleton, again, uh, they're struggling with cardiology too, so we're seeing referrals there. Um, with respect to cardiology, um, we have a relationship with Dartmouth who provides our cardiologists. And uh, we have asked for additional capacity there. Um, actually, contractually, they're obligated to provide it to us. They're unable to recruit. And uh, so this, it, it, you know, this gets right at that challenge for a small institution um, trying to um, fill the necessary specialty care slots. Even when we're partnering with a much larger academic institution, it doesn't doesn't necessarily solve your problem. It's it's a challenge for them, and that trickles down to us. That makes sense. And actually, you just raised a really interesting point uh, with respect to people's vacations and the timing of this request. And I'm just wondering if we are to do this again next year in, in budget guidance, is there a better two-week period that would be more representative of the experience, recognizing that people take vacations in the summertime? And so maybe that would not be a, you know, representative view of the actual wait times. Is there a better two-week window that we should consider? Can I make a suggestion? Um, of course. Especially for small hospitals. You know, we're talking about vacation times for small hospitals where you have one specialist. Um, I, we also have a lot of, um, we have a lot of um, people of childbirthing age here. And uh, so there are other dynamics. It's not necessarily just vacation times. What I suggest is maybe pick I don't want to make more work for us, so forgive me if I say this. I think for us, we have the systems that do it, but pick four quarter, you know, pick four quadrants out of the year and try to do a sampling throughout the year. Yeah. Um, you, you know, where it's not just, you know, okay, the holidays, they're rough, vacation time, they're rough, but we may have someone out on maternity leave, you, you know, and that's going to impact access. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And when we ask for it, we'll say this was the wonderful suggestion of NVRH. Well, my, uh, my my team will pillory me later. Well, you have to realize I'm a doctor. You know, you have to always cite where the source you, is. You, so, 
<laughs> you can just say it was my idea. I won't be here. They can say no, I, want. I can't believe Bob suggested that. You can say Sean suggested or Bob suggested it get submitted with our quarterly submission. <laughs> Done. Done. Um, all right. Well, my you know my last is just my standard, which is if anything, you know, asking every hospital to share any known or likely changes to federal and state payments that you're aware of that maybe you weren't aware of at the time of the submission, any increased relief funds or unexpected increases in Medicare or Medicaid. If you could just let Sarah and her team know um, if something arises in the next week or so or that you haven't shared with us yet. So that is it for me. Is there, are there any follow-up board questions just before I turn it over to our... Nope, I'm seeing shaking heads. Great. So uh, does our hospital finance team have any questions for NVRH? Uh, good afternoon, Sarah Lindbergh, finance team. Uh, thank you for your clear submission. No questions. Okay, great. And, and so I just want to thank you. You've been very helpful. I mean, it was a transition for you and your team and uh, a great job. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, we're learning as we go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you learn quickly. Thank you for your support. All right. Well, with that, I am going to turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Well, I'm all done. Yeah. And I think somebody may not be oh, muted. So if you are not muted, please mute yourselves. And Sam, you're up. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sam Paish, also the healthcare advocate and the health policy analyst. Good to be with all of you. And we're almost at the end. Uh, so congrats to everyone for making it there. Um, just outright, I wanted to appreciate um, the level of transparency and attention you paid with establishing a grievance and complaint process. That was one of our questions. I thought it was very clear and accessible to patients, so I wanted to recognize that quality and the dedication you put there. Um, and also speaking to quality, I want to recognize your community health needs assessment, which I thought was unique in how it established clear outcome areas and worked really hard to establish a study population that was representative of the counties you serve. So I appreciate you for that. Um, First question, on slide 12, where you outlined key factors that impacted the development of your charge request, I'm wondering if you could explain a bit more how you arrived at the 3.2% cost shift increase number. So that was an estimate of our cost shift uh, divided by the $336,000 uh, net patient revenue per rate, 1% uh, rate increase. So okay. um, the, I think the, the charge cost shift, I think it was like, one million, I actually have it right here. So about a million four uh, divided by the 436,000 is a 3.2%. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, you noted as a lot of other hospitals have that patients, you're observing that some folks are leaving traditional Medicare enrollment in favor of what you call replacement Medicare, which I'm assuming you mean Medicare Advantage. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. That's right. I'm wondering, right. yeah. okay. Um, I'm wondering if NVRH does any projections or predictions for churn between MA and traditional Medicare, and if, if so, how that factors into how you develop your budgets. So they, um, Medicare Advantage or replacement pays the same as the traditional Medicare. Um, where for t traditional Medicare, we get a, a, a per diem for our inpatients, a percent of charges for outpatients and reimbursement per encounter for our rural health clinics uh, and the replacement slash advantage products match that. So uh, the reimbursement is the same. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and my last question relates to the community health needs assessment that I alluded to earlier. You discussed the work of NEK Prosper, specifically forming an accountable health community in 2015. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how that effort is supported by the hospital and if it interacts with One Care Vermont at all and what that looks like. So uh, I can start speaking to that and then Di Diana can fill in any. Uh, I was actually there at its inception, so it's <laughs> uh, been a long time. At the time, I was at Northern County's Healthcare. Um, you know, it's really central to our work around supporting those social drivers of health within our community. And um, we meet monthly, we meet regularly, and then we support what are called community co collaborative action networks focused on today's five top key areas, which are the, see if I can do this from memory, well-housed, uh, food access, um, 
physical health, mental health, and well, finance. finance, financially sustainable. And uh, each of those collaborative action networks are made up of uh, members from different um, social services or uh, organizations in our community, including members of, of NVRH's staff as well. And they, they identify op opportunities or projects to work collaboratively with, uh, with our community to address issues in those five areas. So we've continued to do that. We continue to work and uh, collaboratively through the pandemic. In fact, because we had such a great structure there um, with our community partners through NEK Prosper, I think it actually really was a signal strength of ours as we addressed the pandemic in our community. We were able to rapidly ramp up um, um, improved access to food and nutrition um, as the pandemic shut businesses down. That's just one example. Um, we were able to coordinate resources around the, the homeless population, that type of thing. So uh, we, we, we traditionally pay dues into NEK Prosper and uh, um, NVRH pays half the dues for that group, it was typically around $15,000 a year. It's, it's kind of a low cost, like, like it, it's not a big cost center, right? But, but it gives us some money to invest or support those initiatives. Um, honestly, through the pandemic, we put a pause on those uh, payments for all participating organizations, but we have a modest uh, bank account with funds in it. Um, it is also kind of the vehicle through which we make investments um, with money that we set aside through either community benefit or um, we were one of the institutions, or I don't know if the only one, but we set aside 1% of our, um, of our payments through the fixed perspective payment system to invest back into these community initiatives. And NEK Prosper is the vehicle through which we do that. Thanks so much. That's helpful. Those are all the questions for me. Back to you, Chair Holmes. Great, thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'll open it up to public comment. If there's anybody from the public that would like to uh, speak, um, raise your hand. Oh, it sounds like we've got Michael Jeltreco from Voss. Go ahead, Mike. Mike, I think you're on mute. Did the, uh... What about now? I thought I was You're good. good, but OK, yeah. thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Holmes, board members, Green Mountain Care Board staff with a big shout out to Sarah, um, the HCA and members of the public. I know this process can be demanding at times and it's complicated for all involved. So thank you for your commitment to seeing this through. Hospitals have provided you a thorough and candid assessment of where they stand and they've asked you to approve these, these needs-based stabilization budgets. As you've heard today and throughout the hearings, these budgets are about maintaining care for their patients and communities. I'd like to acknowledge the hospital leadership teams that presented as part of this process and also the doctors, nurses, and support staff that the, keep these community assets functioning at high levels during such a difficult time. I've worked in healthcare my entire career and I'm truly inspired by the leadership at every level and at every corner in these organizations. Many of you know my wife is a nurse, so I know firsthand that healthcare workers are special. They manage complex care issues and they provide support for families in great times of need. Unfortunately, I also know the mental and physical fatigue that caregivers are enduring. But here's the thing, no matter what the weather, personal issues they might be managing, or in my case, if we have pl family plans, our Vermont healthcare workers drop everything when they're needed. They're so resilient and they never miss a beat. They are at the ready to lend a hand for their patients, their coworkers, and they support their community in many ways. They deserve us to do the same for them. I often wondered how on earth under these great challenges, are our hospitals pulling off the amazing feat to care for their patients and the coworkers and their communities? After hearing hours of testimony, I think we know the answer how and why. It's their smart and innovative plans to manage the challenges of workforce shortages, workplace violence that should never happen, workplace pressures, travelers, 
steep healthcare inflation, supply chain, the list goes on, capacity challenges. So it's been a long couple of week, weeks, and I know that, and, we st and the 23 budget process is still not over. But as we enter the deliberation phase, I respectfully ask that we remember three things. One, above all else, remember these budgets are about people, patients, their families, and communities, the stories you've heard, and the experiences, experiences are about our neighbors and friends. Our hospitals may present you with charts and graphs, but each figure represents a patient um, or care they may or may not receive and services a community might not have or may, may have. Two, these are needs-based budgets that represent only what our hospitals need to stabilize. These budgets produce modest but critically important margins. Remember, it's a 2% system-wide margin, ve very, very modest. And they ensure that they, these hospitals can make necessary investments in equipment, staff, supplies, and technology. I understand the decision rests in your hands. I've listened to every second of every presentation, as I know you have, and thank you for that. I'm proud of this dedicated group of Vermonters, and I know our state will be stronger when our hospitals are stable. So for the reasons I've stated through this process, and I know that, that all the hospitals have provided so many details, I again respectfully ask you to approve these budgets as submitted. I thank you for your dedication to the process, and I look forward to the next steps, and happy Friday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mike, for that comment. Uh, is there anybody else that wishes to make a public comment at this time? Just raise your hand using the, the chat function. Nope, I'm not seeing anybody. Is there anybody on the phone that wishes to make a public comment? If so, you can speak now. Okay, I'm seeing nobody raising a hand and I'm not hearing anybody from the phone. So I wanna thank the NVRH team. Really, really appreciate the insights you've given us into your budget this year. Uh, Bob, I wish you the best. Andre, good luck in your new transition. Uh, thanks for all the hard work everybody on that, you know, in your team in that room does for your community as well as all of your frontline workers who are not here but are really well represented by all of you. Um, this closes our budget hearings for fiscal year 23. So thank you to all of the hospital teams for providing insights into their budgets. So we've seen obviously the enormous financial pressures that hospitals are facing, largely driven by inflation, workforce shortages, and the system bottlenecks that we've been hearing about. I think we heard more than one, maybe all of the CEOs saying, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, I'll just honestly say I haven't either in my short tenure on the board. So let's hope that this year is the worst of it. And this time next year, the waters are a little less turbulent and the horizon is brighter. Um, to give you a sense of what's next in our process, next Wednesday, August 31st, we'll launch the meeting with a presentation from the state's economists. We asked them to provide us with some advice on which inflation indices are the most relevant to our regulatory process and using those measures to provide us with an assessment of both current and near-term inflation levels. And then after hearing from the state's economists, our hospital budget team will guide us through a framework that we can use to make decisions about the hospital's budgets, along with a staff analysis of each hospital's budget. Uh, I anticipate that we'll complete the review of the decision-making framework and the staff's budget overview on Wednesday, and it's also possible that we might begin some deliberations and voting that day. We have a large amount of time blocked on Wednesday, so we will try and get through as much as we can that day, but it's a, it's a strong agenda already. Uh, we'll continue our deliberations and voting on Friday, September 2nd, with additional time scheduled Wednesday, September 7th, and Thursday, September 8th. My goal is that we'll actually complete all the decisions by September 8th, well ahead of our September 15th deadline, but if not, we've held additional time on September 12th and September 14th. So that should give folks a, a roadmap of the things to come. Uh, we have to have the budgets uh, approved by September 15th. So that's our process between here and now. Is there at this point, it is a happy Friday and I would <laughs> love to have a motion to adjourn. You got one. I will take that from Tom Pelham. Is there a second from anybody? Second. All right, from Tom Walsh, thank you. So all those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed. No opposed. All right. Unanimously approved to adjourn for the day. Thank you, NVRH. Thanks to all the hospitals that are listening and those who have come before us. We will see many of you probably next week during our deliberations. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.